Hey guys, what's up? It's your girl Dev. And today we're going to cover what happened fighting Wind Camp. It's my first Imperium that I've fought in any KVK, really. I think I fought one maybe in Light and Darkness. I can't quite remember. But essentially, this is like the first Season of Conquest Imperium that I fought. And let me tell you, it was an intense fight. I learned a lot and we're going to talk about some of the things I've learned in this fight that um, maybe help you if you're fighting an Imperium Kingdom out there and you are a low spender because in this video we're going to cover some of the battle reports, the open field marches they used, and just kind of compare what I've seen in the past. So I hope you guys enjoy this video. Don't forget to drop a like and subscribe if you haven't done so already. And if you would like, drop in the comments below. Let me know if you faced an Imperium Kingdom and what advice you would give is a low spender or even a high spender what you would give to other players that might be fighting an imperium for the first time so sit back and enjoy the ride So I'm going to talk about some things that I learned fighting an Imperium Kingdom. Uh, the first thing we're talking about is essentially their mass amount of troops that they have. I thought we had a good decent amount between 2170 and 2080 and I thought we would have a pretty good fighting chance. But I underestimated the abilities of these two, this Imperium Kingdom and then essentially the Mimi Alliance in 1175. Their ability to fluctuate between alliances were pretty dope to see overall. They did fight out of two to three primary alliances and Mimi fought between about two alliances and they just kind of picked their battlefield depending on the situation. I will say that early on the thing that caused us to potentially lose the most ground was the fact that they just had the mass amount of troops and that caused us a problem when we're building flags. If you have skillful craftsmen unlocked, then you can only build flags as long as people can fill them. Well, if you can kill the troops before they can fill the flag, then skillful craftsmen isn't really necessary. It doesn't have any effect. I definitely learned that during this season. Uh, they just have the troops out there. And in my situation, when I was building flags in my live stream, I was having issues because troops were dying and they will be flying by me during, you know, when they're heading back to their city when I'm trying to build a flag and I had the big problem with that and placing and back flagging. It was a struggle for sure. And I definitely learned a lot about that. So if you're making any plans on building in a war zone, try not to build in the same route that you guys are fighting in because potentially you can run in the same situation as we did. But it was an interesting process overall and I learned a lot in this experience. And in the next uh, five to 10 minutes, we're gonna talk about the different open field marches that they used and how effective my marches were and their marches were overall. So one thing that the Mimi Alliance does a lot of, that is swarming flags. I feel like every time I turned around, they were swarming a structure. If they felt that they could win it and they got it down to below 50% and we lost the field presence because their massive amount of marches took over the field, we would normally lose the flag. Now it is pretty uh, frustrating the fact that this happens, but when you have like one or two people controlling 10 marches at a time and in their cases sometimes you have one person controlling multiple different accounts on emulators it can get pretty frustrating and they just flood the field with t5 and just swarm the flag now they have the capability to do that so that's good for them but for everybody else it kind of struggles in other cases they would just swarm the rally like here they're swarming a pakal rally which normally you don't swarm pakal but that's what they did and I'm sitting here trying to kill the marches going away and then they ended up canceling the rally and it was just pretty interesting overall. Uh, there was a lot of this. They swarmed either rallies or they swarmed flags. If it was a march in the field, it was swarmable. Oh, you have like an open field march. Oh, you can kiss that goodbye because they're going to swarm that as well. And then you have uh, Perfume of Mimi. She is strange you know like some of her commander pairings that she's using was definitely different she definitely tried using solomon a couple of times with different pairs i found it quite weird that she was using him 
I had to use my anti-swarm, so I'm actually using Zenobia Theo because she liked to swarm my flags. It was really, really frustrating. And when she landed her city right next to mine, I was just like, wow, great. A 600 million power player and then Dev, who's like 70 million. And at this point, I'm under 70. And it was frustrating, but... You know, honestly, he didn't do that bad of a job if they were just using like T5 on my, on, you know, in the rally and they were just using Siege. As you can see, that did work in their favor, but it was just really kind of interesting and weird that they used that. I did allow the people that were filling the flag also filled with mixed troops, so it did make that kind of a fair fight. I was double filling this flag and triple filling it. I was just doing whatever I could to make this thing last. And she used Pakal in this one here. Didn't really trade that well, and she did it like three or four times on different sets of rallies, so I found that quite interesting. She decided to go this route. And again, another Solomon, and I think this is actually Honda in Solomon. Like, yeah, yeah, this is a Honda Solomon rally. And this one actually didn't do too bad. And she prepares to swarm. She keeps them like in a cute little tight form. And then all of a sudden she just swarms these flags. Soon after, she came out with a Pakal Herald rally, which is, this is probably more expected against Zenobia in this kind of atmosphere here where we didn't quite have the field. Now, most of our guys were actually in the north fighting a lot more. We're just down here trying to prevent them from building down and across because essentially they were going to cut our flags. We were just trying to defend in a certain route in order for our people to come back online and protect our territory. So this actually wasn't too bad. Uh, the trades were not as good as I would have liked. I did have Theodora as a secondary because I wanted to make sure I was had that anti-swarm because having an anti-swarm is really important especially when you're getting swarmed it doesn't do well with Zenobia YSS and I felt like I was getting better trades with Theodora now let's talk a little bit about the type of marches that I saw the most of I will say there's a lot of Trojan and Mulans on the field I saw more of those than I thought I would see I saw a lot of Saladin and YSG and Saladin William those were a pretty good handful of troops that I saw in the field. A lot of Pakal Heralds as well. And, you know, I saw a lot of mixed marches with Trojan. And they were actually pretty freaking tanky. And, again, I saw a lot of Hondas. And now I feel like more Honda is a good free-to-play alternative nowadays. Because of the fact he's so versatile, he can be used in a lot of different situations. And, of course, when we were facing a Gilgamesh rally, it didn't fare well for us. Because, essentially, a Gilgamesh does a heck of a lot of damage against Zenobia. Because all this, every time you do a skill damage to him, he does it back at you. So we definitely saw a lot of that. There was also a lot of XY and Williams on the field. And Shonda Gupta's, I saw a lot of that. And Guan, YSG, Guan Leo. You know, the typical marches you will find. There were some, like, random weird ones. Like, there was a couple of Nebuchadnezzars out there. And a lot of support marches. You'd be surprised, like, how many of the support marches are out there um, that actually were beneficial to them. And, you know, we kind of struggled a little bit because the amount of field pressure that they pushed against us. And I do feel like they had a lot of people with five marches. And they had the 300 troop expansion. So... You know, taking five marches with that, that's over a million troops coming at you. That's going to kill you pretty instantly. And especially when they're targeting you specifically. So from, and they're T5. So play all that together in their tech and their gear. It's really, really hard for a player like myself to go up against these kind of whales. And I felt like I did pretty decently. Now, I didn't have a lot of the marches that they all have. So I definitely struggled. I got my kills to up to three and a half million, which is the first time I'm fighting in zone five that I got that much because normally I just garrison. So this time I got to do a lot of open fielding. So that was really nice. But again, I'm still running the basic season one commanders. So for me, I struggled a little bit and I just had some gear on them, but not the best. Uh, I actually used Zenobia YSS in the field because she had all the gear on and I was just didn't have time to change, change them all around in order to supplement and put them on Guan. 
I did pretty decently. And there are times that Zenobia survived and didn't get as many set wounds. And it was it did pretty good. But she was just really just supporting the field for the most part. Um, but overall, uh, I felt like their marches and their ability to coordinate really quickly between multiple alliances at one time and hop over and also be on another alliance territory and attack and rally it definitely put us at a disadvantage uh, the other thing i saw a lot of is mulan mulan was behind trojan in a lot of the marches that i saw on the field and again until together was out there we did see uh, a couple of artemisias on the field not as many, but we did see some of those. And again, their variety of marches was there. You could tell where the whales are and where the free-to-play and low spenders were. Before we head out, let's take a quick look at how the Fire and Earth Camp War is going. Now, let me tell you, they've been fighting at this for quite a few days now. And most of the time they're doing here is just blocking that's pretty much all they did in earth camp was just pop a ton of forts up and down the center row here and it made it very difficult for fire camp to make really any advances so it was really quite interesting to watch to see how this all played out but as you can see they did make some advances here and they are going to be able to cut them off but these forts were really really annoying for them and watching them open field fight and be out there for like three days straight was pretty intense now there was some times uh, recently where they weren't weren't fighting and they just had to just hold structures or they would rally during other people's off time they didn't make any progress because it does take 24 hours ish to destroy one of these forts some, like i think it's like 18 to 20 hours depending on if they heal it or if they need to rally it again but a lot of time so this is pretty much going to look like this for quite some time because of the fact there's just so many everywhere. Uh, but it was pretty smart by Fire Camp to also build along that fi that wall right there. And Earth Camp just putting up a wall of forts to make sure that they can attack them at any time. So they had to make sure they keep multiple garrisons on the field. But uh, did notice that 1185 did drop out of Imperium like within the first couple of hours of fighting so it was definitely a very big bloodbath they did show up in the newspaper so that was a pretty intense battle that they had and again like i said it's still going on so they're still in the middle of fighting and passes open i believe tomorrow or in the next um, eight to twelve hours so that that will definitely allow us to expand a little bit and see how the planning for wind camp and earth camp will be in zone six and before we head out, we're going to finally cover the kills that we have, or the deads that we have here. It was, like I said, a pretty intense battle. We had, had over 814,000 dead. Now, I'm really glad that I had more troops this season, so it was a lot easier to fight and just pull troops back to my city. I used so much resources. I barely have any left. I felt like I didn't have any now. I probably used over a billion... A billion and a half I believe um, in the first day of fighting and ungodly amount of speed ups in order to make sure that it didn't have a full hospital at all at, at, during any of the fighting for two days straight. We were able to hold the Bastion for Metmed so that was really nice. We dropped a fort on there and we held it for about two days. We were getting some pretty kick-ass trades. So overall, I think that we're going to be pretty strong going into the level 7 pass. I'm excited to see how that plays out. And if you're interested in tuning into that, I will be live streaming that as well. And I'll do my best to live stream the Dark Altar. That should be in like 4 or 5 days from now. I'll have to double check because we have to wait to see what time the flux time changes to. And then I will know for sure. I hope you guys tune into that and the rest of this KVK because it's not over yet by any means. And I know that Wind Camp still has a lot of fight left. So stick around for the rest of that coming up in the next week or two. But if you enjoyed this video and you haven't liked it and you haven't subscribed to the channel, go ahead and do so now. But thank you guys again for watching. So for now, guys, just keep it real.